So before we get started, a couple of reminders for this week, or kind of heads up for this week. Obviously, you do have a quiz tomorrow, okay? It will be on naming compounds, and I will post it at 3.30ish today. Okay, so check it out tonight, okay, give it a try. Um, today, we're gonna go over properties of compounds and lab report kind of expectations and format. Tomorrow, we're gonna do the pre-lab stuff for our lab that will happen on Wednesday. Okay, so we will be in the lab on Wednesday, and the lab will be um, identifying unknown compounds from just their physical properties. So the stuff that's in this lesson on properties of compounds is what's gonna help you to identify the unknown compounds that will be in our lab on Wednesday. Okay, so from time to time throughout this lesson, I'm gonna give you little tips like, oh, this is gonna be really important for your lab. Oh, this is gonna be really important for your lab. You might wanna make note of that because they'll be really important for your lab. Okay, so um, they'll really help you out when we're talking about trying to identify things. So what you're gonna have in this lab on Wednesday is at the front of the room, there'll be 12 materials and they'll be labeled A through, okay? K to 12 letters? Something like that. Anyway, okay, A through K or J, whatever. Okay, um, they'll be uh, labeled that and that's it. There'll just be a beaker with those materials in it. You won't know what they are. Okay, you're gonna have to come up to the front, take a sample, and there'll be a few tests that will run on them in order to determine what some of their physical properties are. And then from that, you're gonna have to figure out, is that one water? Is that one table salt? Is that one calcium chloride? Or whatever they are. Okay, you're gonna have to determine what they are simply based on their physical properties. Now right now, that might seem a bit daunting. And that's okay, because we haven't covered the stuff that's gonna help you to do that later. Right, everyone kind of understand where we're headed? Okay, that gives you an idea of kind of what to look for and what to listen for as we go through the lesson today. All right, so the key points for today, okay, learn the properties of compounds, things that are acids, things that are bases, properties of ionic compounds, properties of molecular compounds, okay? Because one of the first things you're gonna to wanna to do when we're looking at an unknown compound is determine whether it's ionic or molecular, okay? And then from there, we'll be able to determine its identity based on some other properties. Now, what kinds of things are physical properties? There's some ideas for things that might be a physical property. Color, color, shape, body. Okay, color definitely one. Could be shape if we're talking about like if it's crystalline, the shape of the crystals or something like that. Okay, uh, size, sort of, but that would depend on more how much of it I put in than than so much its physical properties. Okay, but certainly color and shape. Okay, what else? What else might be a physical property of something that would be very characteristic to only it? Um, right, it's, if it's state at, let's say, room temperature, that would be its melting point, boiling point, things like that. Yes. Smell, definitely. a good start so we got um, smell we got um, shape we've got melting point and boiling point odor okay if I put something in water and it dissolves we say it's uh, that's more chemical property react reactivity is chemical property soluble. soluble solubility is a physical property okay because not all things are soluble in water and actually everything dissolves at a slightly different rate in water, some things dissolve very quickly and other things dissolve very poorly or not at all, okay? All of those are things that we're going to use to identify these unknown compounds on Wednesday, okay? All right, questions so far? All right, so as we were saying, all matter has certain chemical properties. Some are chemical properties. We're not gonna be doing any chemical properties this week, okay? When we get to our reactions lab where we're actually mixing things together and seeing what happens, then we'll be dealing with chemical properties, okay? Chemical properties simply refer to, does this and do this and this actually like react to form new substances when they're put together? That's a chemical property. Physical properties, I don't really need anything else to determine a physical property, okay? To see that water freezes at zero degrees Celsius doesn't require me to have any, any other materials other than water, okay? Does that sort of make sense? physical property is just determined by that thing alone. 
Okay, so physical properties, color, density, melting point, boiling point, all those things we talked about before. Okay, those things can be used to distinguish between different types and different singular compounds. All right, so here's the thing about ionic compounds. Ionic compounds typically exist as crystalline solids or salts at room temperature. Okay. Now, are there exceptions to that rule? Certainly. Sugar is a crystalline solid at room temperature, but it is not an ionic compound. Okay. It is, in fact, a molecular compound. Right? But most things that would be a crystalline solid at room temperature will be an ionic compound. Okay. And ionic compounds typically have very high melting points. Melting point and boiling point are not physical properties we're going to be using in our lab on Wednesday. Okay? They're things that we can maybe infer. Like for example, if one of my materials is a liquid, I know it has a pretty low melting point. Would you agree? Okay? If something's a crystalline solid at room temperature, its melting point is definitely higher than like 25 degrees. Okay? But if something's a liquid at room temperature, I know its melting point is lower than degrees Celsius. Okay, that would be a low melting point. Okay, ionic compounds will also conduct electricity when they're in solution. That is the defining characteristic of an ionic compound. Okay, and it is one of the tests that we are going to run on Wednesday. Okay, the reason that ionic compounds will conduct electricity in solution is because when we put them in solution and they dissolve, they split into the charged particles. Okay, remember last week we learned that an ionic compound occurs when a metal gives electrons to a nonmetal, okay, and then the nonmetal has a negative charge and the metal now has a positive charge. Those charged particles are now floating around in the solution, and because of that, electricity can flow between them. Okay? Regular, like distilled water, does not conduct electricity because it's just pure water. Okay, there are no charged particles in it. Stuff that comes out of the tap, that does conduct electricity. There are minerals and other things in there. We put chlorine in to uh, kill off like bacteria and things like that. Okay, there's also calcium and stuff like that that comes from the groundwater. Okay, uh, so there's all kinds of ions in there already, and it is actually a solution and it does conduct electricity. Everyone kind of follow me there? Okay. So, um, ionic compounds will always conduct electricity, so that's kind of the test that will tell you this one's ionic and this one's molecular. So, this might be important for Wednesday. One of your unknowns on Wednesday is table salt, sodium chloride. One of your unknowns on Wednesday is sugar. At a visual level, do they look pretty close? They're both white or clear crystalline solids, okay? But because sodium is this and sugar is that, which one of those will conduct electricity? We have sodium. Yeah, this one here. Okay, the sodium chloride will because it's an ionic compound that will break up into charged particles. This is molecular. It's all non-metals. Okay, I put this in water, it just dissolves, but it doesn't split. Okay, it stays that way. Right, and as a result, that will not conduct electricity. That would be how I would tell them apart. Okay, because really, everything else for sugar and salt is going to be the same. They're going to look alike. They're going to smell alike. Okay, um, they're both going to dissolve in water. Okay, all of those things will be the same. The only test that will really be different for the two of them is one will conduct electricity, the other won't. They're even going to have similar pH. Okay, they're both going to be like maybe slightly acidic, like a six okay, on the pH scale, something like that. Okay, so they're really not going to. That's the, going to be the only way to tell them apart. All right. Um, so looking at this diagram here, it's kind of showing you how that works, right? You've got a positively charged sodium ion, 
okay? Surrounded by water molecules, a negatively charged chlorine ion, surrounded by water molecules over here, okay? That's, and then this would be a chunk of sodium chloride that's still in the process of dissolving and dissociating into the solution, okay? All right, question there? Okay, some ionic compounds produce solutions that are brightly colored. This will definitely be important because color is a way to identify three of your unknowns on Wednesday. Okay, so not all ionic compounds are brightly colored, okay, but many of them are. Right? So typically, copper containing compounds are going to be blue. Okay? Now, will a copper containing compound Will a copper-containing compound be a crystalline solid? Like, let's say, this. Okay. What kind of compound is that, ionic or molecular? Copper's a metal, right? This is copper to sulfate. So, okay, this is a metal, this is an ionic compound. So this will be a crystalline solid at room temperature. And because all copper containing compounds are blue, this will be a blue crystalline solid at room temperature. Okay, this is the process that we're gonna need to go through on Wednesday. Okay, I'll give you a list of the identities. I'll say, you know, here, here are the possibilities for these compounds. And what you have to do is match up. A is copper 2 sulfate, B is water, C is sodium chloride, and so on. Okay? So if you're going down that list and you see copper 2 sulfate as one of the unknowns, you can say to yourself, okay, that's an ionic compound. It's going to be a crystalline solid, and because it's got copper, it's going to be blue. It's going to dissolve easily in water because most ionic compounds are soluble, and its solution will conduct electricity. Well, now all I got to do is go through my observations and find out, okay, that one was a blue crystalline solid and it dissolved easily in water and it conducted electricity. Boom, that one's copper sulfate. Okay, I'm okay with that idea? Right. Nickel containing compounds are green. Okay, so if I had. No, that's hard to see because I'm writing in green, but nickel 2 nitrate, okay? Nickel's a metal, so that's an ionic compound. It's going to be a green crystalline solid, okay? So on and so on. That's what we're looking for, okay? Coming ahead. And then cobalt-containing compounds have kind of a range, but they're anywhere from pink to red, okay? Like almost like a rusty or blood-colored red to a very faded pink. Okay, so cobalt containing compounds will typically be pink. Um, one that's not on here because we're not going to have a compound that contains it, but lead compounds can often also be yellow. Okay, it's not going to be important for Wednesday because we don't have any that contain lead for Wednesday. All right. Will those three things identify help you identify one quarter of the unknowns? Well, since you have 12 unknowns, I'm pretty sure 3 is 1 quarter of 12. So that should be pretty helpful on Wednesday. Okay? Now, if you see something that's blue, do you automatically go, that's copper, or should you still run all the tests? I would say you should still run all the tests. Okay. All right, now, molecular compounds. Molecular compounds can be solids, liquids, or gases at room temperature. Gee, that's helpful. Okay, it's, it's, I mean, they could be anything. All right, well, I know ionic compounds have to be solids, so in a way that's helpful. If I get something that's a liquid, I know it's not ionic. Okay, I know it's definitely a molecular compound, and then I can look at my list of unknowns and go, okay, it's not that one, it's not that one, it's not that one, because it's definitely molecular. Okay, um, they tend to have very low melting and boiling points. Again, that's not something we're gonna test, but if we see that something is a liquid, obviously we know it's molecular, okay? Um, we're not going to have any gases, okay? So none of the unknowns are going to be gases. It's really hard to keep a, a gas in a beaker, right? 
and it's hard to like sample it and test whether it dissolves in water. So we don't have any that are gases. Okay, uh, molecular compounds are not usually as soluble. Okay, so they may or may not dissolve in water as well. Okay, think about like oil and water. Okay, oil goes on top of water because it doesn't, it's not soluble. All right, sugar is soluble, but it's not as soluble as salt. Okay, you can dissolve way more salt in a liter of water than you can sugar. Um, the, comp the solutions they form do not conduct electricity, okay? so that's going to be important. Okay? Molecular compounds are not usually as soluble, and they do not conduct electricity. Okay? They can be any state at room temperature. Okay. And the last thing is, they don't have any like brightly colored natures. Okay. So if you're looking at a molecular compound, it's going to be transparent or dull okay. or something like that. All right. Now, what if this situation happens? Spoiler alert, this situation is going to happen. I have two liquids and they're both clear and they both don't conduct electricity and how do I tell them apart? What's something I could do to both of them? Like let's say one of them is water and one of them is isopropyl alcohol. Smell, okay? I mean, you guys know what hand sanitizer smells like? I mean, God, for the last three years, we've used more hand sanitizer than in all of civilization before, okay? Um, so you know what it smells like, okay? We know that alcohol has a strong odor, even though all its other physical properties are very close to water, okay? The other thing is you have to watch it because over the course of like 20 minutes, it'll evaporate, okay? Over the course of 20 minutes, the water will not, but the alcohol will. Okay? I often have to refill the beaker during the lap okay, because so much of it will evaporate. All right. Um, everybody okay with those ideas there? Okay. Just, again, think about how you can use these things and what properties might be useful to identify something. All right. Acids and bases. Okay. So acids are compounds, and we're talking about strong acids here, that have hydrogen ions in them, H+. Plus. So any ionic compound where hydrogen acts as a metal is going to be an acid. Okay, so a very common example, hydrochloric acid. Okay, this is stomach acid. It's the stuff that's in your stomach that helps to break down and digest food. Okay, so because hydrogen is listed first, okay, this is going to behave as an ionic compound and as an acid. The more hydrogen that a compound can donate to the solution, the more acidic it is. Okay? That has to do with maybe how many hydrogens are in the compound or how easily it dissociates. Okay? Now, which would be stronger, this or this? two hydrogens. If I dissolve that in water in an equal amount to this, this will give more hydrogens and it'll be more acidic. Okay, so any compound where hydrogen is listed first, it behaves as a metal and it'll be acidic because it will donate H plus ions. Here's an exception. Is that acidic? It's also not ionic because it's <coughs> water, okay? So here's the thing you have to know about chemistry. If there's a rule in chemistry, water is probably the exception to it, okay? We can write water as an ionic compound. We can write it like this, okay? All acidic compounds donate hydrogen. All basic compounds donate OHs, 
Water's got one of each, that's why it's neutral. Okay? It donates the most basic thing, it donates the most acidic thing, and they cancel each other. Okay, what about this stuff? Would that be very acidic? Okay, even more so than, than the other two, right? It's got three hydrogens. All right, so that's what you're looking for. If you've got an unknown compound and it tests as a very strong acid, look for an ionic compound that starts with hydrogen. If you have one, that's probably it. Okay, now. Acids are also highly soluble in water, okay? Like, they dissolve really, really easily, okay? And in fact, when they do this, there is usually an increase in temperature. So that when you make or dilute an acid, okay, because what we have in the lab is like what we call glacial acids. So we have special containers that are filled with these acids, and they are as basically as concentrated as they can possibly be. Right? What we have to do is obviously dilute those so that you can use them. Okay? And so when I dilute that, I don't add water to the acid. If I did that, the temperature would get so hot that the glass wouldn't be able to expand quickly enough and it would shatter. Okay? So what I have to do is have a beaker with a fair amount of water in it and add acid to the water so that the water can help absorb that energy that it gives off. Okay? So those are going to be kind of exothermic when they um, dissolve. Okay, now, are we going to run this test? No. You should never taste something if you don't know what it is. And some things you shouldn't taste even when you know what they are. Okay? It's just not smart. Okay? So no, we will not be sampling any of these. Okay? I like to make my concentrations for labs like uber concentrated. Okay? Because um, I like the results to be very, very clear. So if you sample one and it's a strong acid, it might be the last thing you taste. Okay, as it dissolves your tongue there. For the rest of your life, I have to talk about how long. Okay, yeah, I don't want that. Okay, so um, make sure you're not tasting or, or like anything like that. Okay, now we are going to have a litmus indicator. Okay, and it's not going to be just red or blue. We actually have hydrion paper that will change 13 different colors. Okay, based on a pH from 1 to 13. Okay, so if it turns red, like bright red, it's a very, very strong acid. Okay, then lighter shades of orange up to kind of a neutral yellow, and then some kind of more greens to almost a bluish black. Okay, and as we get to strong base. And there's a little thing on the side of the container, which I'll show you tomorrow. You just put the litmus paper up to it, and you compare the color, and that tells you what pH it is. All right. And acidic solutions obviously have a low pH, okay? So that is less than seven, seven being neutral. Anything lower than that is acidic. Okay, questions on acids? All right, now bases also, strong bases are also ionic compounds. Okay, and usually their solutions will conduct electricity very well. Okay, so your strong acid and your strong base are probably going to be your best conductors in the lab. Okay, um, and typically bases taste bitter. We don't, well, obviously we're not going to test that. Okay, um, and they'll turn litmus indicators color towards the blue end, okay, of the, of the pH scale. So anything eight and higher. Okay. Um, bases have OH or hydroxide ions in them. Okay? And the presence of this ion in solution causes the pH of a solution to increase. All right, so this here is an example of a base. Okay? Which is worse, acids or bases? Which is more harmful? They're both bad. They're both bad. Yeah, it's just about concentration. 
Okay, that stuff there, that's the active ingredient in oven cleaner. Okay, has anyone ever sprayed that foamy crap on the inside of their oven to clean it? Okay, like you, you do that or like a grill, like if you have a barbecue and you it's a grill cleaner, it's the same thing. Okay, you put that stuff in there and it will like turn that hard burnt stuff into slime. Okay, like it's just that bad. And it, it says right on the thing, use in a well ventilated area. So the worst thing you can do is stick your head in the oven and be spraying that stuff around. If you inhale that, it will literally, the fumes will literally start to corrode your respiratory tract. Okay, like you'll feel a burning sensation in your nose and throat. Okay, it's that corrosive, that caustic. Okay, so a strong base can be just as caustic as a strong acid. Right, so because people get this idea, bases are our friends, acids are bad. That's to totally not true. Okay, a strong acid and a strong base are equal. All right, what if I had this? Stronger or weaker? Stronger, got more OH, that's lime. All right, if you ever watched like any like of those murder shows, like investigation, CSI and stuff like that, okay? That's often what people will, like when they dig a grave, they'll throw lime on the body to help it break down and destroy any DNA, okay? That's how caustic that stuff is. Okay. It's also what's usually thrown in an outhouse. Okay. If you want to make an outhouse not smell bad anymore, you throw that and then it kills absolutely everything in that outhouse okay, in the pit and then it won't stink anymore. Well, so you put more stinky stuff in there. Yeah, that would be smelled out for quite a while. Okay, uh, so all of these have hydroxide. So the presence of hydroxide as an ion indicates a basic Right, so if I have something that's a strong base in my tests on Wednesday, I need to go back into my list of unknowns and look for something that ends in OH that is ionic. Because I could have something that looks like this. Is that a base? Is it ionic? Carbon's a non-metal. That's not an ionic compound. This is alcohol. Okay, this is ethyl alcohol, the stuff that's in booze. Okay, not the stuff that's in hand sanitizer. Well, sometimes it is, but don't drink hand sanitizer. Okay, don't. Um, but yeah, this is this is alcohol. It's not an ionic compound. When I dissolve this in water, it stays like this. The OH doesn't come off, which is why it's not basic. Okay, these are basic because when I put them into water, they split into those. Electricity, it's all that kind of stuff. Okay, if I put alcohol into di into distilled water, it doesn't conduct electricity because it stays like this. It's not an ionic compound. All right, so don't just look for OH and go, oh, that must be a strong base. If not not unless it's an ionic compound like this, then it would be a strong base. All right. Okay. I'm gonna give you guys a short break here, and then we're gonna talk about the uh, lab report format. So going to give you till let's say 915 at 915 if you can have out for me uh, like on your phone the uh, handout that's in here um, and it is lab report expectations have that up on your phone to follow along because that's what we'll be going through next so have that ready for 915 okay okay so if I can get everybody to kind of follow along here um, probably be important to write a few things down. I'm going to give you some tips on how to do a good job on your lab reports. Okay. Um, everyone in the science department here at Holy Trinity runs basically the same style format of lab report. Okay. Um, so that's why we're teaching it to you here in grade 10. Um, and it's probably going to look familiar from junior high. I mean, there might be some changes, okay, depending on who you had. Um, but okay, generally, this is what we're looking for. So in any experiment, the purpose of running an experiment is to investigate a problem. Not necessarily to solve it, but to investigate it. Okay. So the first thing that's going to be in any lab report is going to be your problem. Okay. And that's going to be stated as a question in your own words. So when I give you a lab report, okay, um, it'll be, you'll get a template okay, that'll be basically blank, except for problem, design, 
okay, hypothesis, they'll just, those, those headings will be there and you're gonna have to fill them in, okay? The thing you're gonna have to do for the problem is, if I have something written there on the lab sheet, you're gonna have to rephrase that in your own words in the form of a question, kind of like Jeopardy, okay? So, for a simple example, okay, maybe I'm investigating this. What is the effect of light on plant growth? That's a pretty simple thing, okay? But let's say that's what I'm investigating, all right? So, from there, I have a design. The design tells the person who's reading my, my lab report, these are the things that were changed, these are the things that were observed, and these are the things that had to be kept the same or controlled throughout the experiment so that the experiment could be valid. Okay, so we're looking at the three kinds of variables here. All right. The first variable is the manipulated variable. That's the part of the experiment that is changed on purpose by the experimenter to solve or to investigate the problem. Okay, so that's what's being tested. So in the case of what is the effect of light on plant growth, my manipulated variable would be the amount of light given to the plants. Okay, so in my lab report I would write, the manipulated variable is the amount of light given to plants because all subjects, plants, will receive different amounts of light and light powers photosynthesis. Okay, so I'm kind of explaining in there, here is how and why I am altering the amount of light received by these plants. So my experiment would probably look like this. I would have, let's say, six different plants, okay? One plant is going to be in total darkness, okay? That's gonna kind of be my control plant. It's gonna die. Okay, but I, I need to know what happens if a plant gets no light, okay? And then I'll have a plant that gets four hours of light per day, and another plant that gets eight hours, 12, 16, 20, and 24 hours of light, okay? So now I've got a range of plants getting different amounts of light, okay? That should give me the results I'm looking for. It should tell me what the effect of light is on plant growth, okay? Everyone okay with that idea? So what I'm manipulating is the amount of light because that's what I'm trying to investigate. Now, what should I be observing? What should I be watching for as observations? Given that my problem is the effect of light on plant growth. How much the plant grows. How much the plant grows, okay? That's my responding variable. Whatever it is I'm trying to observe, okay? is my responding variable. So whatever changes as a result of the manipulations made by the experimenter, that's my responding variable. In this case, the growth of the plants is the responding variable because plants getting more light have more energy for growth. Okay, everybody all right with that? Now in there, when I identify the responding variable, I should say how it's responding. In this case, plants getting more light will have more energy and what my measure is. I don't really say that in here, okay? But are there a number of ways to measure the growth of a plant? Like, could I do something really simple, like just measure how tall it gets? Or I could count the number of leaves, or if it's something that makes fruit, okay, record how much fruit it produces, whatever. It depends how long I want to run the experiment for. Maybe it just wanted to be quick and I'm testing on bean sprouts and they'll, it'll be done in three weeks. Okay, uh, but I, I have to have some measure of that plant growth. So when you identify your responding variable, you also say, as measured by. Okay, so in this case, it would be the growth of the plants because plants getting more light have more energy for growth. The growth of the plant will be a measure of its total length um, over the course of the experiment. The total height or whatever I'm gonna use as my measure. Okay, everyone kind of follow me there? So when you're identifying these on a lab report, that's what I'm gonna be looking for. Okay, here's the variable, here's how and why. Okay, the how and why are just as important as the, the identification. What a lot of people do is they go, manipulated variable, light, responding variable, growth, and that's it, that's all they write. Well, that's not gonna get you five marks. That's gonna get you two if you're lucky. Okay, you have to also explain each one. Okay, are there other factors other than light that can affect the growth of a plant? Water. Water, soil, right? Temperature, 
Okay, a lot of those other things that can affect the growth of the plant. What do I need to do with those things? Make sure every plant gets the same amount of all of those. Exactly, control. Okay, these are my controlled variables. I know these other things can affect what I'm studying. I only want to know the effect of light. And if I don't keep all these other things the same, they'll interfere. Okay? If I water one of the other plants more than the others, it might grow better because it got more water, not because it got more or less light, and then that's going to make my experiment invalid. So controlled variables are the other factors that could affect your responding variable that have to stay the same for all of them. Okay? So in this kind of an experiment, Okay? I would make sure that um, all the plants are of the same species. Okay? It would hardly be a fair experiment if I plant a bean, a spruce tree, okay? and I don't know, like an ivy, and then try and compare their growth. They're totally different plants. They totally grow at different rates. That's not a fair experiment. It's not a control experiment. They all have to be beans, same kind of beans. Okay? So same species of plant because different plants grow at different rates. Another control of the variable, same amount of water, because water is an important factor in the growth of a plant. So each plant needs the same amount so that it can't affect the growth rate. Same soil, okay? Plants get nutrients from the soil, and different soils hold water differently, have different amounts of nutrients. Keeping them the same ensures it cannot affect the experiment. Same temperature, as plants slow their growth in extreme heat or cold, choosing an effective temperature for all plants ensures it does not affect the experiment, okay? have to keep those things the same, otherwise they could affect my results. Okay? This is why um, if they're testing like a, a new medication or a new drug, they'll have um, a placebo group. Everybody gets to take a pill. Okay? Sometimes like uh, back in like World War II, if, some, like if they had wounded soldiers, if they'd run out of morphine, they'd give them a sugar pill, a placebo. It has no medication in it, but just taking a pill made them feel better. Okay, is this like psychological effect of when you gave me a pill and you told me it was morphine, so I feel better. Okay, well, this is the same idea, okay? Like if I'm testing a medication and I just say, okay, you guys are getting it and you're not, the people who don't get it know they're not getting it, they're definitely not gonna feel better. But if everybody gets a pill, I get a better idea, okay? If the people who actually get the medication don't do any better than the people who got the fake pill, I know my medication isn't doing it. Okay? The power of the mind is just as effective as the medication I gave them. Well, that's no good one. Okay? So that's still a controlled experiment. Okay? Everything else was kept the same. Everybody took a pill. Okay? Does that sort of make sense? Okay? So that's what your controlled variables are. In a typical lab report, I will expect three to be identified and explained. Okay? And in each one of these explanations, I identify the variable. I explain how it's being controlled and why it's being controlled. So um, it says here water is an important factor okay, um, that affects plant growth. That's why I'm controlling it. How I'm controlling it, each plant gets the same amount. Okay, That needs to be in your explanation. Here's why I have to control it. Here's how I'm controlling it. Okay, Everybody clear on that? Okay, So that section of your lab report is five marks. Okay, So manipulated variable, responding variable, three controlled variables. Okay, identified and explained in that way. How and why for each one. So how it's manipulated, why it's being manipulated, how it's responding, why it's responding, okay? And your control variables, how you're controlling it, why you have to control it. Don't be afraid to ask questions as we go here, guys. Is this seeming somewhat familiar? You probably didn't have to do it in this much detail in junior high, but obviously as we get higher up, you have to see more into it. Okay, now a hypothesis. So your hypothesis is the premise you are working on. Okay, it is an if and then statement. Every hypothesis contains those three words. If and then. Okay, so it works like this. We're talking about our our uh, experiment here with the plants and the light, okay? My hypothesis might go something like this. If plants require light for growth, that's the premise I was working on, that's kind of the problem that I had up above, okay? And five identical plants are given different amounts of light. So the and part describes my experiment, briefly, 
Okay, I don't need to go into detail. Okay, then the then part predicts my results. Then the plants that get the most light will show the most growth. That's a pretty simple hypothesis, but it works for this simple experiment. Okay, it says, I think, without saying I think, it says, if plants require light for growth, that's the premise I'm working on, and I perform this experiment, okay, um, plants are given different amounts of light, then this is the results, okay? This is what will happen if I'm right, okay? And you have to set up an experiment to be right or wrong, okay? There's no sitting on the fence in science, okay? You have to set yourself up for success or failure, okay? And will you lose marks if your hypothesis ends up being wrong? Absolutely not. Most of the time in real science, hypotheses are wrong. That's how we learn. Okay, well that experiment did not show the results I was looking for, so obviously that wasn't the case. I need to modify and try again, okay? That's how science works. You're not gonna lose marks if your hypothesis ends up being wrong. As long as you say in your conclusion, here's the hypothesis, the results said this, 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 and this, therefore the hypothesis is rejected. Fine, that's okay. okay? There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. All right, so um, the if part, okay? Um, so the if and, and then statement that communicates what the relationship between the manipulated and responding variable is thought to be. That's the if part. Briefly describe the experiment. That's the and part. Outline the expected results. That's the then part, okay? So if we're looking at this, if, what is the cause of the problem and the relationship being investigated and describe the experiment, then what to expect if you are correct, okay? If you want to get five out of five on your hypothesis, those are the things that need to be in there. Okay? It's a fairly long sentence, okay? and it's five marks, just that one thing. All right, now, here's what I get lots of times on a lab. I think the stuff will react with, it, with the other stuff. How much are you going to get out of five for that hypothesis? One, you wrote something down, okay? But it makes no sense, and it's not in the proper format, and it's not an if then, and then statement is but it's, yeah, you wrote something down. I'll be nice if you want, okay? If for this experiment with the plants, if you say, uh, plants need light, so the ones that get the most light will get, will grow the most, I might give you two, maybe three, probably two, okay, for that, because it doesn't have if, and, and then in it, okay? It's not stated in the proper format. Okay, so it needs to be in the proper format, okay, things like that. The worst thing you can write in a hypothesis is I think. I, this sounds awful. I don't care what you think. I care what you can prove, okay? An experiment is about proving something. This is the premise. This is how it's being tested. This is what, I'll, this is what will happen if the premise is true, okay? That's what needs to be in a hypothesis, okay? And we generally try to avoid the use of I, us, or we in a hypothesis, okay, if you go back to my hypothesis here, okay, it says, if plants require light for growth and five identical plants are given different amounts of light, then the plants that show the most growth, or, should, or get the most light will show the most growth. There's no mention of I'm going to do this or I think this or then we'll, okay, there's, we just don't do that, okay. In a, in a hypothesis, it is just from like totally the third person, okay, and we are just looking at the subject, what's being done and what's going to happen. Okay? There doesn't need to be a mention of I, us, we, or anything like that. Okay? After your hypothesis will come the procedure. This first lab, we're actually going to write the procedure just so you get an idea of kind of what things should be in a procedure, but after this, the procedure will not be something you have to do. I'll have the procedure done for you and all you'll have to do is follow it. Okay, but for this first lab, just so we get an idea of how to run a controlled experiment, you'll actually write the procedure yourself. Okay, um, so it's a detailed, step-by-step, -step, explicit set of instructions for preparing and performing the experiment. So, explicit doesn't mean it like has a bunch of four-letter words in it, okay? It means that it is abundantly clear. There can be no mistake as to what is happening. Okay, that's what explicit means. So, um, place each plant in um, 
let's say two kilograms of potting soil in a five liter pot. That's explicit. It says exactly this much, exactly this size pot, okay? Plant the seed uh, two centimeters deep. Like those things are explicit. That's what your procedure has to be like, okay? You have to write it so that it's idiot proof. It's true. Write it like the dumbest person you know has to follow it, okay? And that they'll screw it up if you don't tell them every little thing. Don't take that personally when you read my procedures for you to do later, okay? Because that's not at all what I'm doing. This. But it's, I, it has to be explicit, okay? It has to say, do this, do this, do this. Because if you don't follow the procedure exactly, you might get different results and then that's gonna to lead to improper analysis and incorrect conclusions and things like that, okay? So a procedure needs to be step by step. That means it's a numbered list, it's not a paragraph, okay? Like lots of times when I get these things handed in, it's a paragraph, and it's like sentence after sentence. So if I'm trying to follow it step by step, and I read that sentence, then I walk away and I do that step, I come back, I have to start at the beginning and read the whole thing to figure out where I left off. If it's a numbered list, I know I just read step four, and now I'm on step five, okay? So it needs to be step by step, step one, step two, step three, numbered list, always a numbered list, okay? All right, by performing your procedure, you will get observations. It totally depends on the type of experiment you're running, what those are gonna look like. Sometimes they're a chart, sometimes they're graphs, sometimes they're anecdotal recordings. Okay, uh, you know, today the plants appear to be, um, you know, uh, a little deprived of water. They, you know, they were discolored and yellow. Like, those are not qualitative, like they're not measured, sorry, they're not quantitative, they're not measured. They're qualitative, they're things that you are writing down and observing. Lots of, um, like, psychological experiments that, you know, work with, you know, how people think and how their minds work are, are written that way, okay, because it's not something you can, like, measure. I can't measure the level of sadness somebody had or the level of happiness that someone had. I can only describe that. That's qualitative, okay? If I'm doing an experiment with you know, these plants and I measure on day two that plant number one is 10 centimeters tall, that's a quantitative thing. I measured that directly, okay? So depending on the kind of experiment, your observations are gonna look very different from experiment to experiment, and that's okay. You have to pick what observations are important. Okay, for a lab on plant growth, probably a little bit of both is a good idea. Some quanti quantitative stuff, actual measurements with a ruler, and some qualitative stuff. You know, plant number one, the one in total darkness, is, well, dead. Okay, plant number two, which only gets four hours of light, is looking very stunted, and the, the leaves are very uh, pale. And plant number three, that gets you know, eight hours of light, is looking quite good. Leaves are deep green, blah, 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 is eight centimeters tall. Okay, all of those, you've got some qualitative measurements, you've got some quantitative measurements, it's okay to have them mixed in there, okay, but you need to have observations as a result of your procedure. So when you're designing your procedure, you also need to say in there, at this step, the following should be recorded. Okay, so maybe you write in there, once everything is planted, you water it with this much water, this often, and daily at this time of day, you record the following things. You record the height by measuring with a ruler. You record the appearance by, you know, telling me things like the color, um, you know, the general appearance, blah, blah, blah. Tell them what to write down, tell them what to observe. Once your experiment is over, then you have to analyze your observations. Now, in a typical lab report, the analysis is gonna be things that I ask you to do. There'll be some questions and you'll have to answer them, but they'll be analyzing your data, okay? In a real kind of scientific experiment, it would be, all right, I'm looking back on my, on my data, plant that got lots of sun actually died. The one that got 24 hours of sunlight died. The one that got no sunlight died. The one that got 12 hours of sun, 12 hours of, of darkness did the best. The one that got 16 hours and the one that got eight hours, they did about the same. They were, you know, let's say both eight centimeters tall, but the one that got 12 and 12 was 12 centimeters tall. Okay, all right, so I'm analyzing my results. What does that tell me? Well, it tells me that more light doesn't mean more growth. It means there's a sweet spot, that plants need some light and some dark. 
Okay, that's me looking at my data and going, here's what it says. My conclusion is my hypothesis needs to be accepted or rejected. My hypothesis said more light means more growth. Is that what I saw? So my hypothesis has to be rejected. And that's okay. okay? My analysis says that 12 hours of sun and 12 hours of dark is the sweet spot. More than that, didn't do as well. Less than that, didn't do as well. Okay, well, that's an important discovery. Okay, plants need some light and some dark. It's not all about just getting light. Okay, all right, so that's what analysis is. Then I move to my conclusion. Okay, in my conclusion, I would copy and paste my hypothesis. Okay, and that's what I would expect you to do in your lab report when you hand it in. Go back up to hypothesis, copy it, paste it down here. Okay, and then tell me. This hypothesis is acceptable because. This hypothesis is rejected because. Okay, so you have to use your data and your analysis to explain why you accept or reject that hypothesis. Okay, so as an example, as it was found that plants receiving small amounts of light and very large amounts of light showed little growth, it can be concluded plants require certain amounts of light and darkness to be healthy. Therefore, the hypothesis is rejected. Okay. My conclusion stated my findings and said my findings do not agree with my hypothesis. Without saying I, my, or anything like that. Okay, very third person, very like clinical. Okay. Alright, so in your conclusion, so your analysis would be out of five, your observations are typically out of three, okay, your conclusion is typically out of four. So Copy paste your hypothesis, and then based on your the level of detail of your explanation as to why you accept or reject, okay, that's where you get your marks from. Now, the worst thing that can happen here is you go, my hypothesis was right. Is the hypothesis ever right? Actually, it's not. It can be accepted. It doesn't mean it's right. Okay? There's always something that's kind of, you know. You know, this, this can be accepted, however, this blah, 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 okay? So never say, I was right or I was wrong. You're going to get like one out of four for that, okay? You need to have an, ex an explanation that says, the data said this. That means this. Therefore, accept or reject, okay? It has to be, it has to refer back to your data, refer back to your hypothesis. That's the copying and pasting, okay? Refer to your analysis, accept or reject. Okay, so it's a, it's a few sentences as well. All right. Um, and then the last part is evaluation. Two sources of error and how they affected the experiment and how they could be fixed. All right. You're never going to hurt my feelings here. All of the experiments we do are designed to have error in them so that you can identify it. Okay. Even the best experiment is going to have sources of error. So. We can say that in this experiment, um, it was found that, let's say we used artificial light because we wanted to make sure we could really record or um, really make sure that they got the right amounts of light. But any light source is going to put off a little bit of what? Not just light, but also heat. Yeah. Okay. So it was found that the plants that got more sunlight also had slightly higher temperatures. Being that temperature was supposed to be a controlled variable, this may have had an effect on the rate of evaporation for those plants and is thus a source of error that could have contributed to the poor growth of the plants receiving large amounts of light. Okay? In a future experiment, um, a temperature control system may have to be put in place to ensure that temperature is controlled. Okay? And if it was only a couple of degrees, it probably didn't play a huge role but it still wasn't perfectly controlled and thus is a source of error. So where's the best place in your experiment to look for sources of error? Which variables? The control variables. Go back to your control variables. You know those are the things that can affect the experiment. And if there's any place where they're not perfectly controlled, that could mean that error crept in. Okay, maybe also in your lab, maybe one of the seeds didn't germinate. Is that a source of error? Okay, 
How do you fix that? Well, maybe I plant two plants for each one in case one dies, in case one doesn't germinate. Okay, then I don't lose that whole thing. That's an easy, it's an easy error to fix. Okay, so tell me the source of error. Okay, how did it affect the experiment? How would you fix it? And sometimes the how you would fix it may seem unrealistic. Like, I get this really fancy, expensive climate control system. You don't actually have to do that, but it would be a way to fix it, so you can say it. Okay? There, cost isn't a factor when you're talking about ways you could improve it. Okay? It's like a wish list. Okay, is that making sense? All right. So when we do our uh, pre-lab stuff, okay, what we're going to do is look at the tests that we want to run. Okay, we're going to look at the experiment that we want to want to do. Okay, we're going to come up with our variables. We're going to do a lot of that together. This is your first high school lab report, so I'm going to I'm going to really hold your hand through this one. Okay, um, and then I'm going to kind of back off more and more as we go along with our lab reports. Okay, in this course. Okay, they're all going to have this format. Okay, you're going to have your problem, formal question. Okay, you're going to have your variables, your design, manipulated, responding, three control. You're going to have your hypothesis, if, and, and then statement. You're going to have your procedure, which other than this lab will just be follow the instructions. Okay, your observations, which will be three marks. Did you record good data? Okay, for this lab that we're doing, like I'm going to check through your observations. If A is supposed to be a clear liquid, that doesn't do anything in any of the tests, that better be what I see. Okay? If you say, you know, oh, well, it had a pH of one when it's supposed to be neutral, yeah, you did something wrong. Okay? That's going to affect your results. It's going to affect your observations mark okay? because it's really going to mess up your analysis. Um, and then your analysis, okay, like I said, that's going to be most of the time just answering some questions. For this first lab, it's going to be the identification of your unknowns. So you're going to have a chart, and it's going to say unknown A, B, C, D, and you're just going to put in the, fill in the blank. A was uh, ammonium chloride, D was uh, nickel 2 chloride, or whatever. Okay, you're just going to have, that's going to be your analysis, just identifying the unknowns. Okay. Then for your conclusion, as I said, copy-paste your hypothesis, and then, all right, well, each unknown had, you know, its own unique properties, uh, these properties were able to, uh, we were able to use these to identify our unknown compounds, or each compound had its own um, unique set of properties that matched up with observations from the data set, uh, whatever you want to say, hypothesis is accepted or rejected, up to you, okay, and then sources of error, okay, what are some sources of error, and that you get by kind of paying attention in the lab, okay, like if you see something you're like, man, this is really frustrating, I wish this worked better, that could be a source of error. Okay? Man, it'd be so much easier if I had way more of this stuff. Or, man, this would be way easier if I could see this better. Okay? Those can be sources of error. If it interferes with your ability to get data, it's a source of error. Okay? So kind of be thinking about that when we're doing the lab on Wednesday. Okay? So a lab is typically going to be out of 30. Okay? So you will get, uh, this first lab will be out of 35 because you're actually writing the procedure. Okay? But you'll have design. Okay, that's out of five. Your hypothesis, also out of five. Okay, your um, observations, out of three. Uh, your analysis, out of five. Your conclusion. Four, uh, your error or evaluation. Out of three, and then lastly, overall. Out of five. Now, the overall part that has to do with things like readability, quality of work, etc. If I open up your lab report and it looks like it's bleeding because there's so much of it underlined in red because it's spelled wrong, okay, those are the kind of things that affect your overall mark. Okay, um, if it looks like you've put like zero effort in, you basically just check the boxes and half the stuff is blank and whatever, that's going to affect the overall mark. Okay, um, things like that. So it's mostly a format kind of thing. Okay, so make sure that you 
format it well, you take the time to run the spell checker, okay, stuff like that, it's little things. Okay, but that's the overall part of the lab report. Okay, so out of 30, this first one, as I said, will be out of 35 because you'll also have a procedure that we'll look at and you'll write with your group tomorrow in class. So tomorrow's class will be writing up the pre-lab problem, variables, hypothesis, and procedure. Okay, so you're going to get a full class well, after the quiz to do all of that. Have the Chromebooks booked. Okay, so you'll be in here working with your group, getting that together, okay, and getting an observations chart ready. Since we can't take the Chromebooks into the lab on Wednesday, um, whatever chart you make for your observations, you need to have a printed copy of that, or open it up on your phone, you can fill it in on your phone in the lab, I'm fine with that too. Okay, um, whichever, uh, just make sure you have that uh, ready to go for Wednesday. Okay. All right, questions on lab report and format and things like that? Okay. Let's have a look at, these are some of the things we want to do in our lab on Wednesday. This you'll need to write down because it's not in your notes anywhere. Okay, if we want to be able to identify unknown compounds okay, using just their physical properties. These are the observations we need to make. So these are the things in the procedure that you'll have to write up. Okay, these are the tests you're going to want people to run. Alright, so the first test and it's actually kind of a series of tests that you're going to run, is what we call the observable properties test. These are the physical properties that are directly observable without you really having to do anything other than come up and be near the compound. Okay, so color, okay, making an observation of the color, so that could be white, transparent, blue, green, red, okay, whatever it happens to be. And it's state of matter. So is it solid, is it liquid, or is it gas? What will that tell me? Or what could it tell me? If it's a liquid, I know it's, it's molecular. Okay, so that's, that's one observation that's pretty important, pretty valuable. Okay. If it's a solid and it's crystalline, it's probably ionic or molecular. All ionic compounds are crystalline solids at room temperature. Okay. So does that mean all crystalline solids are ionic compounds? Those, those are not mutually exclusive. Okay. But it gives me a pretty good idea. Okay, so I'd want to observe color. I'd want to observe the state of matter. Okay, I would want to observe the nature of the matter. Is it crystalline? Is it cloudy? Is it molten? Is it, you know, like, what, what does it look like? Detect the odor safely. Yeah, wafting. Okay, so I don't like put my nose in the beaker and go because the, the, snorting the, the compound is not going to give you a, like a good idea of what it is. Okay, so you just need to waft it. If odor is important, the odor will be obvious. Okay, and it will be obvious enough from just doing this, holding it kind of this far away and just wafting some fumes towards your nose. Okay? If you don't detect anything, you don't need to keep going. It's got to smell like something. Mr. Coderre said odor was important. Some things that don't have a smell. Okay? If it has a smell, you'll smell it right away. Okay? And you can record. This smells like hand sanitizer. Or this smells like um, Windex. Or this smells like, what, like whatever. Whatever your observations are. Okay? Okay? So odor test. Okay? We would want to waft. Okay? Would that be something you'd put in your procedure? Yeah. 
definitely. It's a safety thing. Okay? If you just write perform odor test, someone's going to stick their nose right in there and snort it. Okay? You need to keep them safe. That being said, probably one of the first things in your procedure should probably be go into the lab, put on a lab apron and safety goggles. Okay? Before they do anything, that would be the first step. Now, you don't have to wear a lab apron in our lab, okay? but if you like what you're wearing, okay, maybe you want to wear a lab apron. Okay? Um, but you don't have to wear the lab apron, but goggles are not optional. They have to be on the whole time. And by the way, if I see this, that's not wearing safety goggles, okay? They do not, they're not a forehead protector, okay? They have to go over your eyes. Okay. All right, after we've done the observable properties test, okay, then we would probably want to move on to a solubility test. Because once I put this thing in water, I can't perform any of the observations in the first test anymore, because now I'm changing it, right? I'm putting it in water. So, how would I describe performing a solubility test? Because this is what we're going to have to do tomorrow. Okay? Do I just write perform solubility test? Because if, if I just write perform solubility test, someone's going to take a gallon of water and they're going to dump it on two grains of salt and go, oh, it dissolved. Might have just been washed away, who knows? Okay? But I would probably want to be specific. Right? Like if I'm talking about using a small container, maybe you know, add this much of the material and this much water and then mix. Okay? And in fact, for us, we want, to, we want to observe not only whether it dissolves, but we also want to observe if there's any temperature change. Okay? So that's going to require using a thermometer and having a thermometer in the material as the water is being added. These are all important details that need to be described when we're writing our procedure, okay? There's a difference between perform solubility test and perform solubility test by adding, um, you know, filling container to one third full with material and then adding water until the container is three quarters full with material or with water, stirring while recording the temperature. Observe whether or not any changes in the appearance of the um, material are noted. Okay, uh, rounding of edges on crystals, disappearance of crystals, or change of color of the water are all indicators of, of uh, solubility. Okay, is that a lot different than perform solubility test? Would you put the water in first? No, I would actually have to have the material in first with the, with the thermometer, and then add the water. That way, I can observe exactly what happens as the water is added. Because if I sprinkle it and it stays on the top. Right, then it's harder, it's harder for me to do that. And I might, if I fill it to three quarters and I start adding the stuff, it might overfill. Right, so it's easier to have the material in first. Okay, so I'm looking for dissolving, I'm looking for temperature change, I'm looking for color change, and if there's any change in smell. Sometimes when you add water to something, there's suddenly a smell. Okay, so also something to watch for. Starting to see where you're getting a whole class period to work on this tomorrow. Is there going to be a fair amount of stuff to type? Like this procedure is going to be, you know, it's going to be pretty long. It's probably going to be close to a page okay, by itself. All right. After the solubility test, I now have that material in water, either dissolved or not. What was the test that was going to tell me whether the material was ionic or molecular definitively? electricity. Okay, so that's my next test. Okay, you're going to have a little conductivity apparatus. It's got two kind of brassy uh, electrodes that come off the bottom of a black plastic box. Okay, there's a little button on the side of the pla uh, plastic box. You press it in and then you sit in the water and there's a gradient from 1 to 10. Okay, and the lights will light up depending on how conductive it is. If it's super conductive, all 10 lights will light up. 
okay? If it's non-conductive, none of them will light up, okay? Anything below kind of five lights is considered to be non-conductive and thus on the molecular compound, okay? More than five lights, it's gonna be ionic, okay? You're not gonna get any that are gonna be five lights. It's gonna be like one to three and like eight to 10. It's gonna be pretty obvious. Okay, so that would be my next test. I can't perform that test until I have the material in water. So I have to perform it after the solubility test. Okay, so that would be my next test. Okay, and it's pretty straightforward. Okay, place the conductivity apparatus in the solution created in the previous step, press the button, record the reading on the face of the meter. Which is still more detailed than perform conductivity tests. Right? Somebody might take a car battery and two jumper cables and go like that, right? You need to make sure they do it right. How important is it to rinse the apparatus between tests? Very. It's the presence of ions that gives you conductivity. If you carry them from one thing to the next by not rinsing it, you're not going to get good data. What kind of water should you rinse it with? Distilled water. Okay, that's all got to be part of the procedure. Okay, we'll leave it there for today because Bill's going to go. Okay, so make sure you have a look at the quiz tonight after I post it. It'll post around 3.20, 3.30, somewhere in there. Just check the classroom. Okay, and then we'll uh, work on this stuff tomorrow.